that, that kind of thing. So it did, I, I did need to get it all out and then see the prismatic, the larger picture and see um, that the hard parts were really just a sliver. It was just enough of them and the silencing of it made them hurt for longer than they needed to. So thanks for the question. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, as others have said so gracefully, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, I really appreciated that. I resonated with a lot of it. Um, I guess sort of what I was wondering is, do you think in the years since, you know, getting past your childhood and all that, have you found more of a sense of belonging um, by anchoring yourself somewhere? I would actually say, um, because I'm an actor, I'm so lucky, I always feel absolutely 100% at home on any stage in any theater. So if you've got something like that, uh, it is a, it's a, just a, it's a psyche saver. Um, because LA, ha I've lived there my whole adult life, which is impossible, right? For a TCK, you're like, how? Like, I don't know. But it's mainly because I, I pursued acting and until you've really, really established yourself, it's not a good idea to then move just when you've gotten your foot over the door. It's incredibly hard to get your foot in any door in Hollywood. And then I met my future husband and I'd always said I will never move for a man, but I find myself staying for a man because he was in LA and for the career. Um, and I actually was up to here with LA and anchoring myself. It, it actually is just not natural to me. Um, and this show touring the world made every bit of difference and now I'm fine and it's like LA is where I'm based, but as long as I can take the show and I'm no longer touring it, but I can take the film when we're no longer in pandemic times and screen it and do talkbacks and leave my workshop, then it'll be fine. So if you've got something like that, even if you find yourself not anchored in a place, I think you'd be fine. And some people do anchor themselves in places and, and they, they can do it. Thank you for the advice. I'm, I mean, I'm still a college student. We're working on that one. <laughs> right. Uh, if I can ask another follow up question, I'm also wondering how you understand your American identity today, because I can imagine maybe, you know, in your youth, it was something that you resonated less with because your transition to America was especially difficult. But now that you, you know, went to college at Wellesley and you you're based in LA, do you identify as an immigrant? Do you understand, identify as American? Or do you still identify as TCK? I still identify as TCK, and but I've been in the States so long that it's kind of morphed into expat American who kind of settled in the States, like American TCK, because I've been here so long. And I hadn't, you, you know how you don't notice that you're adapting and assimilating? You just, it's just a natural thing that happens. You know, you sort of catch culture and then it becomes part of you. So I realized when I was visiting my folks in Costa Rica and feeling irritated at how narrow the roads were, it was like, oh, I'm American now if I'm irritated at the narrowness of roads. And I quickly like had to work on myself. <laughs> you don't wanna be that, you don't wanna be that way. Don't be that way, don't be that way. You know, you should be fine if water pressure isn't the greatest, strongest with the hottest water 24 seven, like that's incredible privilege that I didn't grow up with it, but apparently I've gotten used to. So I always have to like, don't, don't go all the way into the, it's best if everything is plastic <laughs> mentality, which I sometimes feel when I'm in the States. I also have another question um I was curious about your the process of creating that show you said it took two years and I was just hoping you could kind of explain like what that was like and the challenges of it and I can imagine like it it required like so much vulnerability and um yeah just like how you managed to be able to do that <laughs> thanks and I say two years but I think I, I think I wrote what was interesting is that that book that I talk about at the end that my brother sends me and I write the essay. Well, the essay was actually about creating a solo show, which I had not created yet. 
but I'd been thinking about it and I realized, oh, if I write an essay about creating a solo show, I'll have to create the solo show. So the first, the excerpts that are in the essay are the first things I ever wrote for the show. And those first lines, I think were in like December, 2009. And then I finally had a performable first draft, like two and a half years later. Um, I'd already had a first draft, but it was terrible, it was terrible, it was terrible. So I took a six month masterclass on doing solo shows and presenting, you have to try to get up and present every single week to your classmates who are working really hard and doing their own solo shows and impressing everybody. So seeing other people be vulnerable gives you permission and courage to do it yourself, at least for me. And also seeing magnificent performances fail sometimes in any given week. Somebody who was always like being brilliant would not be one week and then realize, oh, it's okay. That's part of the process, that's the creative process. So it took a while again, because I wasn't working on it all the time, but the six month masterclass that required you to have a show at the end of it really helped. Deadlines are everything. And the vulnerability was, it, it wasn't that I wasn't terrified. It was just that like, if the fear was here, there was this much more need to tell the story. That's all, like a hair's breadth more need or courage or whatever we want to call it. I'd say need. <laughs> and uh, I just encourage everybody to tell their own stories because we, we just need to hear all the voices as much, you know, as many more voices than we've been hearing. And, and you know, the US is getting better about that now, but could do a lot more. So that's what I would say to that. Thanks for that question. Hi. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I really enjoyed the show. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. But um, I had a question about something that you briefly like alluded to um, during the show. You talked about how like the being called out um, or constantly being asked where you were from was something that you only experienced in the US and or like you felt like you primarily experienced in the US. Um, and so I was wondering like how why you think that was, and then also like how you how that has affected kind of your um, perception of the U.S. as opposed to like other places that you've lived. I think um, that's a great question. I think I was asked that so often and othered so often because we 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 kept living in Fairfield County. First, it was New Canaan, Connecticut, and then it was Fairfield, Connecticut. I actually love Connecticut, just not Fairfield County so much. Um, because it was very predominant, it was just like homogeneously white and um, and quite wealthy because it was close to where Xerox was based. So that's where we were. And 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 so any place that's homogenous is gonna call you out for your not being like them. Um, and so I kept feeling like that's an American thing. And I don't know if that would have been true had I grown up in LA, but it did influence how I felt about the USA because I kept thinking but my mom's American and I nah. and what it did was make me think they they the Americans don't appreciate they say one thing we're the big melting pot but they do the opposite and they don't seem to know it and and, and I don't think they do appreciate, they, I used to think, like middle class and up Americans didn't seem to know how privileged they were. Like the 24 seven water, you turn it on and there it is and it's hot and just great water pressure and the electricity never going out or if it does, it's like, oh, lost power. Whereas in countries that are developing, it's a typical thing and you get used to it. So I thought they say they're the great melting pot but they're the opposite. Racist, racism is everything in this country and that's hard. It's awful anywhere, but where they never acknowledge it, it seems by the majority that that was really tough. And they don't know how wealthy they are. Now I've been here forever, so I've seen much more nuances, um, but that was my impression in the beginning or when I was you know, first, first two decades of my life. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll read Elaine's question. Just curious, but was your brother's essay also published in the anthology? Yes, it was. Yes, he got published too. So yeah, you're very, very proud of that too. Hi, 
Hi, yeah, so thank you so much for this. Um, as like, um, I guess Ryan and Lynn, I'm also, I can classify myself as TCK. Um, I'm ethnically Korean, uh, grew up in Singapore, but went to an American international school. And I think um, what a lot of TCKs struggle with is like representation and a sense of like feeling that sense of belonging. And I think what's really great about this film is that for TCKs, you kind of get that sense of belonging, um, you know, just knowing that someone else has gone through something very similar. Um, I'm wondering if you have where you found that sense of belonging and you know whether or not there's other um, people or even mentors in your industry or other industries that helped you, um, you know, as you grew up and developed as an individual, um, find that sense of representation and belonging. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I say, did you go to uh, Singapore American School, SAS? Yeah, yeah I did. Oh, I performed this there in 2016. So that's awesome. Oh, um, great. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, again, I, I get my sense, I do get my sense of belonging from pretty much anyone who grew up cross-culturally or interculturally in any way with like feet in different worlds at the same time, one foot here, one foot there. And, and then not that maybe they feel like an island or maybe they feel like a bridge or maybe they feel like neither. Or they're sort of, like they say in the book, among worlds. And that could be anyone. You could be, you know, transnationally adopted or the child of divorce and you grew up in both households because your parents got joint custody and they had very different rules. So you had to be a slightly different person wherever you were. But definitely with TCKs and definitely with any artists, performers, creative people, theater people especially, because the storytelling. And also it's a lot like TCK life when you do a play or a film or a TV show, you get together to do, you're all working on this together and you become like a family, you're in that bubble and then you disperse. And that's the end of that, which is not great, but it's so familiar. So thanks for the question. That's wonderful, Lisa. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are just about time. So if there is no further comments. Uh, Please, I think I speak for everyone when I want to extend our gratitude to you for being with us here tonight. Um, and we are lucky enough to have you on Wednesday leading us in a workshop as well. So thank you for screening your amazing film with us and being with us here to, to chat about it afterwards. And we will see you on Wednesday. Very much looking forward. Thanks, Lisa. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you all for, for joining us. It was a great to, to get your questions. And I'm so glad that you came and saw the movie. And I really I just, thank you. Really appreciate it. And I'm seeing everybody's thank you. I'm going to just stay to watch the chat. That's fun. <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. Take good care. Thank you all. Thank you.